Welcome to a conversation with Andy Donkin, Chief Marketing Officer at Under Armour and graduate of the Question School of Business, MBA, class of 1993. I'm Ken Freeman, Allen Question Professor and Dean here at the Boston University Question School of Business. Andy, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks, Ken, I appreciate it. Now, Andy, let's tell us your story. How did it all come out to be for you to become an outstanding marketer? Did you know this from the beginning, or did it? Oh yes, I was born to do this. You were Ken. born to yes, do this. Exactly. Okay. Well, tell no, us I wish, a bit about I wish it. it was that easy. I think um, I actually, uh, when I graduated from Boston University, went to Colgate Palmolive. So uh, really, actually wanted to be on the brand side because before graduate school, I had been in sales, um, but felt that I really wanted to understand more about why people bought things that they did, um, and wanted to create things that I could see actually bought at the shelf. Uh, so I went to work for Colgate Palmolive and really learned some of the real fundamentals of how you market and how you build the brand. And that was kind of the start of things. And I loved the idea of trying to get inside consumers' heads to understand how they thought about the purchase decisions they were making. Mm -hmm. And you've had several stops along the way. I mean, I have. Under Armour, you've been at some very famous places and some that aren't necessarily That's so right. famous. How did your career evolve? Yeah, it's interesting. I'd love to say it was a master plan on my part, but um, in uh, 1999, uh, I left Colgate and made the decision to go out to the West Coast uh, and uh, get into things all internet. Um, and joined an interesting company called Tickets.com that actually had been a software roll-up of three different software companies and was built to take on Ticketmaster, quite a task. Um, the fun thing about that as a marketer was I knew that I had to understand digital marketing in order to be effective because there was this thing called the internet. I uh, wasn't quite sure exactly what it meant yet. Um, but knew I had to understand it and learn it. And I think the interesting thing for me was as I started out in brand where you're kind of the king of what you do, you un, you know, you're leading the brand story, you're managing all of the programs, went into the internet where the engineers really were the champions. And uh, when I first went to tickets.com, they spent well, at least six months torturing me about my lack of knowledge of technology. <laughs> and so I had to quickly almost learn another language uh, about what technology was so I could actually interact with the engineers on a credible basis to go build the features and functions that consumers were looking for at tickets. Wow, and then beyond that, of course, you, you ended up later on at Amazon. I did. Uh, driving major branding efforts and now at Under Armour. Yep. Uh, West Coast, East Coast, uh, how has the, the overall marketing function, if you will, in an organization changed in the 25 years since yeah. you got your MBA? Yeah, I think it's changed in a number of ways. I think obviously the rise of social media and the rise of digital has played a, a huge role, huge impact. I think in my initial days at Colgate Palmolive, I would have a media plan that might have three or four parts to it. I think today what you have is a media plan that has hundreds of parts to it um, because of digital because you can actually go and talk to consumers in ways that are very authentic as long as you have the content that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, you couldn't do that. You basically had one big campaign, you spoke to people, your target market, yes, but you spoke to them in one particular way. Um, today, what's happening is people expect that when you communicate with them, it's gonna be uh, something that's relevant to them, something that matters to them. Um, but of course, each individual target group has a different interest. And so you have to be much more savvy about the way you build your media plans to be able to reach those folks and get them involved in your brand. So much more complex. Uh, than, much more than complex than it was before. Much more complex. Have you had mentors along the way and, and how did you identify them or did they identify you? Yeah, I think uh, we all have mentors either explicit or unexplicit, uh, inexplicit uh, within our, uh, our experiences. I think uh, certain groups like Amazon has a, a mentor program um, where you actually are connected to a senior executive uh, to understand uh, the Amazon culture uh, and understand how Amazon works because Amazon had a very unique way of working. Um, so I've been lucky enough to have those senior level executives, whether it was at Colgate, or even at Tickets, who, uh, where the CEO played a role in mentoring me, uh, to Amazon, where one of the senior uh, 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 executives mentored me on how Amazon worked, was really insightful to be able to be effective in those environments. Now your current assignment, of course, you're working with Kevin Plank, founder, yep. 20 plus years ago. Yep. Uh, Jeff, uh, of course, at Amazon, yep. founder. 
Uh, what's it like uh, to work in an organization where the founder is yeah. still in place? Yeah, it's been uh, actually something that I really have begun have begun to appreciate in a much bigger way. I think founder DNA, the passion behind building that business, is some intangible that's almost impossible to replace once that person is gone. And I think that from Kevin, from Jeff, from other founder CEOs I've worked with, understanding how to harness that passion in ways that are productive without losing the cultural uh, uh, equity that's been built over time, because that cultural equity is what makes the company go. Um, and so being able to be part of that and learn from them how that culture that they've developed over 20 years continues on to uh, produce a, a company that continues to grow fast and continues to attract new users. It's, it, it's hard. It feels also like they are, in the end, part of the brand of the organization. Yeah, that's exactly Not right. only internally, but externally. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think, especially today with social media, um, it's very difficult to um, extract the founder from the brand. The founder is the brand, um, and they share an equity. And I think that's important for consumers because it um, helps understand the purpose of that brand and who they are. It also helps with consistency over time in terms of what that brand stands for. Now, Under Armour has chosen to compete in a very competitive space, of yes, course. Yes, it is. Now, how does Under Armour strive in this very competitive world to differentiate itself? Yeah, I think in a couple of different ways. I think that the uh, positioning that we have in the marketplace kind of grown from a DNA of um, on the field, uh, really football uh, uh, activities, and then going from there, starting with a, a t-shirt. And if you, know, if you talk to people about a t-shirt, they'd say, well, that doesn't seem like a very interesting idea, but Kevin literally reinvented the t-shirt uh, and brought a better way for, for athletes to perform on field, which became this proposition of, under Armour making athletes better. So everything we do from a product standpoint is figuring out how we use innovation to make athletes perform better on the field, or if they're off the field, have apparel and footwear that makes them be able to live their life in better ways. And I think for the differentiation for us, that's part of our DNA. I think the other part of it is, as we continue to grow, there were acquisitions made around what we call the connected fitness business. It's Map My Run, Map My Fitness. These apps actually connected a whole new user group to Under Armour because these were folks who weren't necessarily uh, playing football. They could have been uh, folks who were running a marathon. They could have been folks who were looking for nutritional trips, uh, tips to lose weight. Uh, they could be looking to connect to a community like Run Club so they could be part of that community. That's a very different audience than someone who might be looking for the latest cleat. So for us, our differentiation is looking at that 24-7 activity of a consumer, not only on the field, but everything they do off the field and how they actually connect to the community. So you're integrating digital into your product, essentially, exactly. at the very same time as you drive uh, the positioning of the company. Uh, digital marketing has become, has eclipsed in many ways, I imagine, traditional marketing, or do they coexist? Or they coexist, the relative yeah. Priority? I, think, I, I don't think of them as um, uh, co-opting one another because in the end, it's part of the ecosystem that you use. Uh, what's interesting is that traditional media like television still is one of the um, most robust mass mediums to reach a big audience for certain programming. Let's take Super Bowl as an example, the ultimate you can reach 110 million people with that particular broadcast. Of course, it steeply declines from there. But as television becomes more fractured, um, what happens is you've got younger consumers who aren't watching television, right? They're getting their information from their mobile phone. Um, so as a marketer, you have to begin to look at, yes, there are mass reach vehicles like television, but being able to connect with your younger consumers every day, you're going to have to be on mobile platforms to be able to be compelling and relevant to their lives. So beyond the being on the mobile platforms, how has digital marketing changed the consumer's decision-making process when they're making the, uh, the decision, the purchase decision? Sure, I think the big change is the influences that they have, right? So if you go back 20 years, they were getting influenced possibly by what they saw on TV. Today, they're being influenced much more by what they see in their social spaces. So by their peers, by their friends, by athletes, by artists. So they're looking for cultural clues from their influencers that help them understand what product might be right for them. That's a huge sea change from seeing an ad on TV and going to buy something. So the role of brand influencers, the Tom Brady's of the world, the Stephen Curry's, et cetera, how does the company make the call in terms of who it wants to have right. as brand influencers and who it might not want to have. As yeah, so uh, we have a criteria that we use to try and understand 
the characteristics of that athlete um, that might be a little more on the intangible side, really understanding that athlete's instincts to win, for example. And then we also take a look at how they communicate with their fan base and what they mean to their fan base. So how big is their social platform? Um, what do they talk about? What are the things that interest them? So we use uh, that criteria to determine who might be a good brand fit. But what's interesting, Ken, is that not only do you look at the athletes we all know, but then there's a whole group of influencers who many of us might not know, who don't necessarily have 100 million followers, but they might have 5 million followers or 6 million followers who are very loyal and uh, almost advocates for them. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting for us as we think about the influencers in our space, it isn't just about those household names. It's about people who are passionate about the spaces that they're in and use social media as a way to communicate to their interesting. families. Interesting, and this whole idea of micro-influencers then, is that primarily, it, it's hard to think of a micro-influencer with five million followers, right. but, uh, but also it's, it's friends and family, it's colleagues, it's uh, the social media activity becoming more and more prominent as a, a force for a consumer to make the decision? Then? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, if a consumer 16 to 24 is on their mobile phone almost every hour of the day. Um, we, we notice that here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? So uh, how many times have we uh, had our face in our phone when we run into the telephone pole, right? So it, that is what life is about today. And so for a younger consumer, being able to uh, connect with them in an authentic and real way on their mobile phone in terms of subjects and content that they're interested in, that's what starts the flywheel because they then share that information with others um, and they connect to the brand in ways, again, that wasn't possible even uh, 10 years ago, where the consumers you are intersecting actually are taking a role in uh, connecting with your brand uh, and have say and influence over what your brand is, is showing from a content standpoint. Traditional, re traditional retail is facing some real challenges, obviously yeah. we see this. Uh, and uh, online is becoming more prominent. Uh, what's the future for traditional retail? Yeah, I wish I had that crystal ball. I, I don't know what is in the future for, for physical retail. I, they certainly are facing uh, headwinds. Um, it's interesting though, you can break the market up. Let's look at Under Armour, for example. Uh, we have our own branded stores where we control the experience in those stores. Um, and there are users who come to those stores because they feel like they want to be part of that experience. For um, a, a, a wholesaler, uh, someone who might uh, service a number of different brands, I think the hardest challenge they have in front of them is really understanding what the consumer expects within that physical experience, and it must differentiate itself from online because I shop online for a number of particular reasons. It might be convenience, it might be because uh, selection, I might have a wider selection. Um, but I still have real need for that physical retail store because that introduces me to products that I might try on that I wouldn't otherwise be able to through an online experience. So there's a real purpose there. So I think retail, physical retail needs to understand how they uh, amp the physical experiential uh, equity that they have with their consumer so it becomes as much of a destination uh, as it does just a storefront because now online is the storefront. So you really see these as complementary, not I think one or so. the other. They really do complement each other. Uh, with uh, the evolution of artificial intelligence, yep. uh, 3D printing, uh, the ever-desiring need for more and more speed right. to market, how do you see the traditional supply chain activity changing as we move forward? Well, I think you hit on two different things, right? One is artificial intelligence, and I look at that as it relates to marketing. So I was at Amazon when uh, Echo was introduced. Um, one of the fascinating things about something like Echo is for a younger consumer, their expectations for how AI should work with a device they interact with has changed. They expect it to react right away. They expect it to know what the answer to their question is. So take that to things like search. So today, you and I might type in a search because we're so cool that we type it in. For a consumer who's 16, they're saying, uh, hey Alexa, uh, tell me where I can find this or tell me something about this particular uh, historical fact or tell me where I can get the best pizza. So that's their expectation is they should be get instantaneous response from AI. So from a marketing standpoint, we need to really think about how AI really intersects the experience, the purchase decision that consumer is making, and that AI experience will get better and better 
uh, and consumers will expect more out of it. So it's really changing it from a marketing standpoint. On the supply line standpoint, and I'm not an operations guy, but I can think and hypothesize about how it might change things. One of the things I think that's going to be very interesting to watch is 3D printing. It's already being done today in a number of different ways, probably not to any scale for apparel and footwear. However, the idea of customization, the idea of personalization in footwear and apparel, uh, potentially relies on that ability to cut your supply chain from an 18-month cycle to a two-week cycle, mm -hmm. right? Unheard of. So could 3D printing be something where I actually can customize my order for those shoes? We're using a product called Icon right now, mm -hmm. where consumers can actually come online and design their own aesthetic for their shoe. We've had a tremendous response to that. The next step will be to design the shoe itself. So as we get more and more into that area of personalization and customization for apparel and footwear, there's going to be big strides that are going to be need to made on the, made on the supply chain mm -hmm. so that my expectation is when I actually make it, I'm going to have it at my door probably two days later. Amazon's kind of made sure of that. So how does that actually work? That's going to really change things yeah, from sure. the expectation of today. Very interesting. Now, skill sets. What are the kinds of skill sets you're looking for uh, as you bring colleagues into yeah. Under Armour? Yeah, so from a marketing standpoint, I think what's changed is we now have internal agencies that, again, 10 years ago I may not have had. And what that means and why we would do that is because I need skill sets to understand digital and social media who may be able to actually not only create a particular piece of content, but they may actually develop the concept. They may write the script. They may develop the piece of content. They may edit it and they may post it all in the course of about six hours. Uh, that's a very different skill than in the past when you had uh, single skill sets that did all of those things and it might take two weeks to produce a piece. Um, or I might just have people who are really good at getting our influencers just to go film what they want to film. And they become curators on what is the best content that's going to work across these different formats. And when we look at creative people and marketing people, we also want them to understand the formats that they're operating in. So deep skills around Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, BuzzFeed, because these platforms all react in different ways to the consumers they're interacting with. So I, I, oftentimes I think about it as in my creative team, I like people who think about are creative, but also think of themselves as editors or creating stories and being able to get those into the market. On the digital marketing side, performance marketing side, it's how do I intersect the ability to deliver cost-effective marketing through performance, search, affiliates, uh, email, uh, but at the same time be able to tell stories they have to be storytelling, because otherwise I'm just going to ignore it because I'm overwhelmed with messages. So those folks who work in performance marketing can't be just scientists. They actually have to have some art and some science in terms of what they do. Um, I think also when you kind of look uh, at, at what we do on a daily basis, um, it's almost those skill sets that uh, may in the past have been thought of like sociologists and uh, anthropologists and psychologists, people who really understand consumer uh, experiences and motivations. I think about it from a UI UX standpoint. How do I build experiences that take consumers on a journey that map to their motivations for why they go seek out information, why they might buy a particular product? Um, and that um, social science actually adds to the richness of how I might think about that online experience for a consumer. Very interesting. Now, you hire uh, new hires from universities, no doubt. Uh, are there areas of shortcomings of new hires generically that if you could wave the magic wand and inform higher education, right. they'd say, hey guys and gals, get it together. We need yeah. to do a better job of X, Y, yeah. or Z. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to give a funny answer and that is um, defy convention. I think that oftentimes business schools will teach a particular formulaic uh, answer to a particular question or to a particular uh, line of thinking. And if one thing that's happening today in marketing, it's quick on your feet and being nimble and being able to analyze a situation and understand how to react, that there is no playbook. Um, and so that idea that there isn't a playbook I can take out of graduate school and then apply it to my first job, that can be a disconcerting uh, idea <laughs> mm -hmm. because that's why I spent all that money and went to graduate school, right? So I could get a playbook. So because the environment is changing so quickly, 
the people who succeed are the ones that actually are every day thinking about what's changing and how that might impact the way that they would go to market with a product or a message. And so that nimbleness, right, and back to the idea of having art and science, that there isn't a formula to be able to go out and execute for most of the, even the people who work in the, um, in the data side of our business, the best data people that work for me actually take both the intuitive part of understanding the consumer and the analytical part of what the data tells you to be able to create something that's differentiated in the marketplace and do analysis that actually gets you insight that you couldn't get any other way. So those are the kinds of skills for someone coming out of graduate school of understanding that there, um, there isn't an, a, a necessarily a playbook that using all the things they learned and then adapting that to the situation that's very fast moving is critical to them being successful. Your career is marked by so many successes, Andy. Uh, are there any uh, leadership lessons that you've learned? If you think about the one or two, three core elements of yeah. lessons you've really learned as you have continued in your career that, that you might share with us. Yeah, I, um, uh, I don't know if these will be wildly different than maybe other folks have, have talked about, but a couple of things that really stick with me. One is this idea of constant innovation, um, that the world moves so fast you can never sit back and think that um, you're going to be able to put something in place and then it's going to uh, basically be uh, compelling to someone for a long period of time. It could be, but you don't know. And so being open to getting feedback about the ideas you put into place so that you're constantly taking the pulse of the consumer in the marketplace. I think the other one is never forget to think big. In the end, from a marketing standpoint, we're all about creating big ideas. And so performance marketing, digital marketing can end up feeling like it's a little bit um, uh, uniform and strict, but actually it's just another platform to be creative in. And so some of the best ideas that we all resonate with from a creative standpoint are ideas that um, potentially took risk, um, potentially were unconventional, um, but were very well thought out and had a great insight into what the motivating idea was. And so I think if, if I take that idea of insight being my third one, it's how do I tap into the insight? This goes for whether it's North America, China, India. How do I get the insight of that consumer about why they care what they're buying or what they're doing? Um, and searching for that insight is hard. That's a really tough thing to do. Um, and I guess the last thing is, um, despite all the uh, I've talked about in terms of innovation and kind of chaos in the marketplace, the ability to build repeatable scale with your approaches is a really critical part of growing. Because what ends up happening, what I've observed over time, is the leaders that understand how to build repeatable scale. And that does, again, doesn't mean that it's a template that never changes. It means that it's a, the ability to uh, take a process and turn it into something that uh, is able to turn out a relatively understood outcome is really important to being able to grow as a business. Um, I guess there's one other one that I've learned, and that is the ability to work backwards. Um, and what that means is that I think about the outcome that I'm trying to create, and then I work backwards from there in terms of building my plan. And it's a really interesting way of working, as opposed to starting at the beginning and going, I'm going to go build this plan. It's starting at the end and working your way backwards. Outstanding. Now, you mentioned thinking big is one of those lessons. Now, thinking big often implies, of course, that we may not always have the right thought, and in right. fact, there may be a failure. Right. Is there a failure you might share with us along the way uh, that you say, you look back and say, hey, I had a failure here, and what might you have learned from it? Yeah, um, I'll take, uh, hopefully my Amazon friends won't mind me t talking about this story. I think Amazon Fire Phone is a good example of a product that um, didn't succeed in the marketplace. Um, and I think there's a bunch of reasons for that. I think one, a very tough challenge in terms of uh, a company not known for technology getting into that space. Uh, two is thinking about the features and functions of something like Fire Phone um, and really understanding how compelling those were to consumers or how early it was. Um, the, the upside of understanding how features and functions might uh, not work or the lessons learned is that those features and functions may be applied to something else. So Fire Phone used to have this feature where you could point it at an object and actually understand what that object was and then potentially uh, order it. Um, that technology has gone on to be used in other ways, right? And so it doesn't mean just because you have a failure that 
those lessons learned can't be applied to other projects. And I think the biggest lesson learned from Firephone, and I give Jeff uh, Bezos a lot of credit for this, is that he also knew when to stop, uh -huh. when to say no. And I think it, uh, for all of us, it's so hard when you put your heart and soul into a project um, to not think, oh, I can think of another way to make this work. <laughs> um, and I think the lesson I learned from Amazon was there comes a point where you say, we know enough that we're going to stop and we're gonna cut our losses and we're gonna invest in other areas. And so that was a really big lesson for me because that was not an easy thing to say, we're going to stop that with all the investment that got behind it. We focus heavily also here on, on helping our students learn how to exercise informed judgment, mm -hmm. to consider the variables and to, to live to their values. Have you ever encountered an ethical dilemma through your career where you know, uh, you knew there was a big challenge, you had to make a call. Yeah. Uh, might you share what that my experience might have been and what you might have learned from that experience? Yeah, I, I can share some uh, kind of macro uh, situations yeah. that um, uh, uh, have confronted um, businesses that I've been part of over time. Um, I think the, um, the idea that potentially in areas like the ticketing business uh, or uh, like the sports business where um, potentially you can uh, create workarounds to get things done, um, which may um, really uh, shy uh, uh, or get up to the ethical line of what's appropriate to actually go accomplish uh, something. Like, oh boy, if I just signed this venue, um, that would make us so much bigger. But in order to sign that venue, I might be being asked to do something I don't want to do. Um, I think the, in the end, you have to be true to your values because it sounds easy to say, but if you decide to cross that ethical line, um, what ends up happening is that marks you in a different way. It starts you down a path that says, where is the line? And I think we all have to have a line into which we'll go to and then stop. Um, and I think for me as a, as a manager, I think it was, understanding that I had to stay true to that ethical line, and it didn't matter that if we didn't get that particular venue, um, that that meant that uh, we weren't going to be successful. We were just going to have to say no to that. And saying no as a business person is probably the hardest thing to do. Yeah, so having to really go with your value system, if you will, when you the, encounter those I, tough calls. I do, I think it's the value system you have and the value system your company has. And I think that's why it's really important, and I've worked at startups, to large companies like Amazon, it's having that rock solid value system as a company is really important, not only for who you want to be associated with, because your values should match the company values, um, but also it gives you a roadmap, yeah, right, sure. for what the company believes. Mm -hmm. And so being able to follow that roadmap is really important um, as a person and as, a, as an employee. And reputation matters for the company, for your organization, for yourself as an individual. Okay, you know, and today's very transparent, so I always think about um, you know, anything you do today, it's gonna end up in the press. Whether you think it is or isn't, just think <laughs> that way. So every time you come across those tough situations, I usually ask myself this, uh, the question, what if this ends up in the press, what will that article say? And so if you say, oh, well, this is what it'll say, and that actually supports the values you have, you'll be fine. If you use that in, uh, as a filter and say, I've crossed the line, then you probably should say no. Andy, a final question. If you were to give a, a word of advice to our students uh, that are preparing to, to leave the safety of academia, to enter the, the world of work, uh, any words of wisdom you'd care to share with uh, our students? Um, be proud of what you've learned, but in a way, leave everything you've learned at the front door. <laughs> and I, I think that sounds very counterintuitive, but what I mean by that is the situation you're gonna go into will be different than you know, the two years you spent in graduate school. You have to be open to the fact that everything you learned is operating on a very volatile environment because things change so fast. So use the things that you learned at graduate school but apply them in ways that you understand may change almost on a daily basis. So by having that openness and having that understanding that being thoughtful is as important as being true to what you learned at school will help make you successful because as you and I kind of talked about before, especially in the marketing side, but I think it's true in many of the different disciplines, it's art and science. And science, you might be able to map in terms of how a particular formula works. Uh, on the art side, that can be changing and can be different depending upon what perspective you had. So no matter whether you're a computer engineer or whether you're a marketing person or a creative, have that balance of art and science as you think about the decisions that you're making. 
and the impact you can have. Important words of wisdom, arts and sciences <laughs> uh, uh, in the world of business. Exactly. Uh, fantastic. We've been in conversation with Andy Donkin, Chief Marketing Officer at Under Armour. Uh, thank you for joining us, and Andy, thank you for an outstanding conversation. Ken, thanks very much, appreciate it. Thank you.